Well, folks, if you've got a Bible, you could turn to Psalm 103. Uh, Psalm 103, I'll read it for us shortly. But let me just uh, say again, uh, I have a lot of love for you guys. Uh, a lot of love because this is my homeland, but also um, I love your leaders, uh, love your church, love the mission that God has called you into. And I love how you're starting off the year uh, thinking about uh, this theme of, of soul care. And um, just these first few weeks of the year, uh, January, uh, a new year, they're more likely to be a time where we press into body care than soul care, aren't they? Like if you're a member of a gym, you know the frustration of seeing uh, an influx of people who mean very well but won't be around in a few months' time. Uh, they come in and they uh, uh, make you queue for the treadmill and the row machine, whatever. If you're into swimming, then you see the lanes in the swimming pool clog up and you're flapping around trying to get your space. If you're into running, lots of nice new pairs of trainers in the park. Lots of people giving it a go uh, in these first few weeks of January. And our social media just knows, doesn't it? Like It just senses that we just want to get fit and get into shape and look after our body at this time of year. And it starts sending us all sorts of adverts and programs for dieting and fasting and, and getting our bodies into shape. And rightly enough, the Bible, the Bible does care about our physicality. The Bible would say that we, each of us here, we are embodied souls, that God has made us up of, of what is physical, which will one day die and perish, and what is eternal. Uh, what will endure beyond this life. And we should see, as we think about this issue of soul care, we should see that, that our bodies aren't things that we should neglect. Like God has given us this physical frame that we are in. It is a gift from God, and so we should steward it well. Like we should watch what we eat. We should watch how we, how we exercise. We should watch how we sleep. We should care for our bodies, but not at the expense of our souls. In fact, the Bible lifts and elevates soul care to a real priority for God's people. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is, is sending out his disciples, and he tells them not to fear those who can kill the body, but the soul. Like for Jesus, caring for our souls is a priority, even more than, than caring about whether someone can take our life away from us. And back in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, God tells his people this. He says, Take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. And God gives that command to his people right before they're, they're going to enter into the promised land. God has promised them physical blessing, and they're about to take hold of this physical blessing. But before they take hold of what is physical, God says, don't neglect, don't forget what is eternal. Don't forget to take care of your soul. It's a priority. Dallas Willard, who, by the way, if you want to, after this series, just have a think and maybe study a little bit more about, about the practicalities of soul care, if you want to start somewhere outside of Scripture, go to Dallas Willard. He is, he is a phenomenal writer and thinker about these kinds of issues. He was a pastor in America and a writer, theologian, and he says this when he's talking about what the soul is. He says, the soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates, integrates, and enlivens everything going on in the various dimensions of the self. It is the hidden or spiritual side of the person. It includes an individual's thoughts and feelings, along with heart or will with its intents and choices. It also includes an individual's bodily life and social relations, which in their inner meaning and nature are just as hidden as the thoughts and feelings. And if you want to sum up what Dallas Willard is teaching us there about what the soul is, our soul, in essence, our soul is our whole life. It's what enlivens our whole being. It's what continues to exist after, after our body eventually dies. It has true and lasting eternal value. And so it makes sense to prioritize caring for it. 
it makes sense that we don't neglect it. It makes sense that God would call us, as he did there in Deuteronomy, to take care of our souls diligently. So where do we start? Where do we start with caring for our souls? Let's read Psalm 103 together and see what the Lord has to teach us this morning and see what it looks like for us to begin to care for our souls. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, a Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let me just pray for us again before we see what the Lord will teach us this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. These are the the very words of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. Because these are your words, we we know and we believe that they are living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we pray, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Spirit that you would change us, conform us, draw us to be more like you in your character, in your conduct. And we pray this in your mighty name. Amen. What is the priority for our souls? Or maybe we could say it together. If you look down at these first few verses of Psalm 103 together, specifically these first three words, maybe we could say together what the priority for our soul is. I'll count us in, one, two, three, and then let's all say together the first three words of Psalm 103. One, two, three, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Someone carried on there. Well done. <laughs> bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. That's the priority for our souls here in Psalm 103, to bless the Lord. Eight times we read that instruction in Psalm 103. Four times we read it at the start in verses 1 and 2, and then at the end in verse 21 and 22, we read it again four times. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. This morning, I'm going to call that the request for thankfulness. The request for thankfulness. See, we're not really given any context to the psalm here, other than it's more than likely a psalm of David. That's what we read at the beginning. And we know that it's a song that would have been sung by God's people as they came together. Corporately, they would have come together and sung this song in unison, and they would have sung it as a means of teaching one another, teaching each other what it is to walk in obedience to the Lord. And what they want to teach each other in this psalm, it's clear because it's all the way through. They want to teach each other to bless the Lord. 
Even the way that this psalm is set out, just, just in its literary form. If you look at verse 1, you'll see that it mirrors exactly verse 22. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And this is a, a deliberate poetic device called an inclusio. It's a little bit like speech marks. The same at the beginning as it is at the end. And it's written specifically like this in Hebrew poetry to draw our attention to that repeated phrase, to draw our attention to a repeated command, which if you haven't got it yet, you're going to get it by the end, which is this, to bless the Lord. That's what we're being called to, to bless him, to bless him, to bless him. And now, folks, Hebrew isn't my thing, and giving Hebrew lessons definitely isn't my thing, so I'm not going to do that for us this morning. But that word, bless there, because it is repeated so often in the psalm, it just deserves a little bit of attention. So in the Hebrew, that word, bless there, is this word, barak. Now, if you know your Old Testament, you're thinking of someone, that's good. Just go there later. We haven't got time to to, to look at the character that pops up in Judges, but actually... No, we're not going to go there. I'm starting to go there, and I shouldn't. Go there after if you want to. Look in Judges 4 and 5, and maybe that will just deepen what the Lord is teaching us this morning. But that Hebrew word barak means this, to give thanks for, to worship and honor the king, or it could mean this, to receive an award, to receive thanks or blessing from the king. So here's what we see. To bless someone is to take a posture of thankfulness. To take a posture of thankfulness. And if you put that together with this repetition of bless, bless, bless throughout the song, then you'll see that the big idea in Psalm 103 is this. The people of God have a continual posture of thankfulness to God. The people of God have a continual posture, an abiding posture of thankfulness towards God. That's what the psalm is teaching us. But here's what I know. That posture of thankfulness, that continual posture of thankfulness towards God, that is hard for many of us. A lot of us find it hard to have that that consistent, that abiding, that constant posture of of gratitude and thankfulness towards God. Some of us have come in maybe this morning and we've got hang-ups about God. Maybe some of you aren't aren't even believers and, and you've been invited to come along or you're just coming along just to see what this is all about. You don't really know who God is, but you're certainly not in a position to thank him. Maybe some of you are experiencing difficulties in your life, struggles, suffering, and it's preventing you from turning to the Lord with a posture of thankfulness. Maybe some of you, your experience in the church is making it hard for you to come to that place. In the midst of wherever your experience is, you're finding it hard to actually turn to the Lord and say, thank you. Thankfulness to God can be a struggle, but but folks, see this. Joe's already reminded us this this morning, actually. In Psalm 103, we see that it is a song that is sung to to teach one another. It's a song sung corporately to, to help one another understand what it is to walk in obedience to God, but it is also a song that is sung to teach our own souls. Look again at verse 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. David is speaking to himself. He's speaking to his own soul. Now, folks, I wouldn't usually recommend talking to yourself. That can can kind of create some issues for you, but this would be an exception. David speaks to himself. He speaks to his own soul. He requests that he himself would give thanks to the Lord from the deepest part of his being. And he keeps on requesting it of his soul. He keeps on requesting it and requesting it. And I guess he keeps on requesting and demanding that his soul bless the Lord until his soul actually blesses 
the Lord. I mentioned earlier that I have two children, Ruthie and Micah, and they have their moments, like most children do, uh, but they are overwhelmingly a, a blessing to me. And one of the, the things that really blesses me with Ruthie and Micah is that they are not those children who pester their kids. Like, you know those children who, who just demand of their parents and keep on asking and asking and asking for the same thing until like, they wear their, their parents down into, into submission to get what they want? Like We've all seen them, haven't we? Daddy, I want those sweets. Daddy, I want those sweets. Daddy, I need the toilet. I need the toilet. Daddy, can I go on that swing? Daddy, can... And they keep on just bearing and wearing and wearing and wearing their, their parents down until they eventually get what they want. Badgering, pestering, being belligerent little children. And folks, I wonder whether maybe some of us need to take the posture of an annoying child with our own souls when it comes to blessing the Lord whether we need to keep on badgering our souls to bless him, whether we need to keep on coming to our souls and say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, whether we need to keep on teaching our souls, training our souls, requesting our souls to bless the Lord until we actually do it. And we turn to him in genuine thankfulness. And here in the next part of the psalm, we see why we would want to thank him. We started with the request for thankfulness. And now in verses 3 to 11, we we move to the reason for thankfulness. The first reason we give thanks to God is because, because of what he has done. Psalm 103 is packed full of, of things that the Lord has done for his people. And each one of these things in turn should provoke our thanks. They should cause our souls, they should cause us from our our innermost being to turn to the Lord in thankfulness. And we haven't got time to go through them all in detail, so I'm just going to list them out for us so we can see what it is that the Lord has done for his people. And even now as we hear them and we read them, that we can have our hearts, our souls provoked towards thankfulness. See, in verse 3, the Lord forgives his people of their iniquity, and he heals us of our sickness. I think David's talking there about spiritual sickness primarily. The Lord does that for, for those who put their trust in him, but also our physical sickness as well, either in this life or in eternity, will be healed. In verse 4, we're told that he lifts his people out of the pit, I think David here is talking about death when he talks about the the pit. He lifts his people out of spiritual death. And then what does he do in return? He crowns them with steadfast love and mercy. In verse 5, he satisfies his people. He strengthens us with life. In verse 6, he brings about what is right and what is just for his people. In verse 7, he reveals himself to his people. He shows his people who he truly is. In verse 10, he doesn't deal with us according to our sin. In verse 12, he completely removes the penalty of sin from us. As far as the east is from the west, it is gone. And all of these things, all of these acts are done for God's people by God. And I wish we had time to unpack each of these in turn, but we don't. And so I'm just going to sprint to where these verses are pointing, and I hope that you can see it. As you look at each of these actions, the forgiveness the Lord has brought, the salvation the Lord has brought, the satisfaction the Lord has brought, his revelation, his mercy, his justice, I think we can see that he is pointing to a specific moment in history where these actions were accomplished for God's people. He's pointing to the cross. I don't think I have to do much work to help us see that. David talks about a transition of death to life. He talks about forgiveness of sins. He talks about justice. He talks about righteousness. He talks about healing. All of these things were just secured for God's people at the cross. And so, friends, if you're struggling this year to take a posture of thankfulness towards God, can I encourage you, look to Jesus Look to Jesus and remember what he has done for you at the cross. Remember how he has dealt with your sin and death through his death. And remember how he has satisfied your soul with eternal life through his resurrection. 
if you're struggling to be thankful to the Lord, look to the cross. Think about what he has done for you. But not only that, think about who he is. Think about what the Lord has done, but also think about who he is. See, I said before that you don't, you don't get much context in the Psalms, and specifically in this Psalm here, you don't get much background information apart from we know this was sung by God's people, and we know that more than likely this was written by David. Braxley, even just knowing that helps us understand something really important here. As David writes this, looking at the content of the psalm, it's clear that he's writing this after, after he's lived a bit. He talks knowledgeable, knowledgeably and experientially about, about sin, about suffering, about sickness. And if you know David's life, you know that he was well acquainted with each of those things. He struggled with sin. He struggled with sickness and suffering. David had joyful days, and he had dark days, just like all of us. And yet the refrain of his soul was continual thankfulness towards God. His desire was to give thanks to God in every situation because of what God had done and was going to do for him, and also because of who God is. Um, during the early 2000s, there was a song written by uh, Matt and Beth Redman. And it became a bit of an anthem uh, in the early 2000s. It was a really popular song, and it was written in response to the 9-11 attacks in America. Uh, and Matt Redman said, as he was writing about uh, the song that they, they wrote, he said he was struck uh, just in the aftermath of, of 9-11 by how little vocabulary the church had in terms of music in, in order to respond to, to times of difficulty. Like how, how little music we had that would help us really respond uh, during those seasons of, of darkness, those seasons of struggle which, which we all inevitably face. And so he and his wife wrote this song, 10,000 Reasons. I'm guessing you guys sing it. Um, I'm not going to sing it for you now. I'm going to read uh, just the, the first verse, I think it is. It says this, Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And the Redmonds wrote that song after studying the book of Job together. And the book of Job, we often think, is, um, is like a lesson in suffering, a lesson how to suffer well. But actually, the Redmonds said this as they reflected. It'll come up on the screen here. They said, thinking about the book of Job, and Matt Redmond said, I think it's really about something much grander than, than just suffering. The sovereignty of God, of which suffering is a subcategory. At the end of chapter one of Job, it says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Trust is a beautiful act of worship, he says. It says to God, I believe in you, in your unfailing goodness and greatness, no matter what season of life I find myself in. Friends, there is a reason to take a posture of thankfulness to the Lord, even in the darkest of times, if we know who God is. If we know who God is. So if you look down at the psalm again, almost in the middle of the psalm, in verse 8, we read this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And then in verse 9, David tells us how we know that to be true. He says that, that the Lord will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Now, that is a familiar verse if you know some of the Old Testament. I know you guys went through the, the book of Exodus a few years ago, didn't you? And you, you spent some time afterwards looking at who God is, and so this verse will be familiar to a lot of you. It was certainly familiar to, 
God's people in David's day, because verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is exactly how God reveals himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses wants to know who it is that he's dealing with. And God says, okay, this is who I am. I am merciful, I am gracious, I am slow to anger, and I am abounding in steadfast love. That is who he is. And folks, unlike our situations, unlike the seasons of life that we will go through, unlike the days which are good on on, on one week and the days which are bad on the next week, unlike our situations which will flux and change and shift and be different one day to the next, God is always the same. He is always merciful. He is always gracious. He is always slow to anger towards his people and abounding in steadfast love. He is always those things. And folks, that is so important because there are times, a lot of us are there right now, there are times when our situations and our circumstances are heavy and they are dark and they are sorrowful and they are painful. And our flesh, the world, and the devil will say to us, there is nothing to give thanks for in this situation. It's just bleak and it's dark. And you're just going to have to deal with it. In those moments, Psalm 103 helps us train our soul to look to Jesus. To raise our head up out of the darkness to take a breath in that moment of struggle and suffering and to look to Jesus who is constantly who he is, who is constantly merciful, who is constantly gracious, who is constantly patient, and who is constantly loving. To look to him, to see that he is who he says he is, and to give thanks. Because we can be thankful that our God is a God whose mercy isn't predicated on our worthiness. That our God is a God whose grace isn't conditional on our good works. That our God is a God whose patience isn't exhausted by our constant foolishness. That our God is a God whose love isn't restricted by our moral ugliness. For what he has done And for all that he is, brothers and sisters, say to your soul, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. We see in the request of thankfulness, the reason for thankfulness. And finally, we see the response of thankfulness. In verse 11, 13 to 17, and then in verse 20. This theme of thankfulness is repeated through the psalm, but then as we get to the end, There's another repeated theme. In verse 11, we see that God's love is towards those who fear him. And again, similar thing in verses 13 to 17, we see that his compassion is towards those who fear him. And it seems in the psalm here that thankfulness and fear come together. The fear of God, as you look through Scripture, has two aspects. The the first way that we see fear is, is fear because we know God's holy justice, and so we hide from him. But then there is a worshipful fear, a fear that we see here in Psalm 103, a fear that we're encouraged to embrace ourselves, where we draw near to God, where we respond to God in word and in deed, because we know his holy justice, but also because we know his holy love. In light of what he has done and in light of who he is, the people of God have a constant posture of thankfulness to God. And that thankfulness, folks, is seen in what we say and in what we do. Tim Keller said this, which helps us understand what this looks like. He said, it is one thing to be grateful. It's another thing to give thanks. Gratitude is what you feel. Thanksgiving is what you do. See, it's easy in some respects to look at the person and the work of Jesus and to be thankful with our words, to sing and to say and to, and to preach about the, the greatness of God and to be, to be thankful with, with what we say and with, with what comes out of our mouth. But genuine 
thankfulness, motivated by a holy fear, folks, it asks for more. Just look down at the psalm with me again. Look down at verse 20 to 21. Verse 20, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who, let's say these three words together, who do his will. True thankfulness, true thankfulness will be seen in doing God's will. It's no good singing in this room, folks. And then going home and refusing to submit to what he says in here. I wonder how many of us are doing that at the moment. I wonder how many of us are actively resisting the will of God in our lives. I wonder how many of us are comfortable to sing in here and then and then go back home and engage again in habitual sin, knowing what, what righteousness looks like in God's word. I wonder how many of us are comfortable coming here and singing and giving thanks to God with our voices, but then walking consistently in ungodly attitudes and behaviors, knowing what godliness looks like. I wonder how many of us are Resisting the will of God, maybe over an area of sacrifice that he's calling us into. And you're just choosing to stay in the comfort and the safety instead of stepping out where he wants you to step. I wonder how many of us are actively resisting the will of God by, by resisting walking in obedience to, to the area of obedience that we know he's called us into in his word. Those who are truly thankful will do his will. So as I close, what does that look like for us this week? What does it look like to train your soul to respond to God in genuine thankfulness? Well, oh, friends, it starts in here. It starts in God's word. It starts with spending time in his word, drawing near to Jesus, coming to him in that holy fear, listening to his voice, asking for the help of his spirit to discern his will, and then doing it. Doing his will. Friends, say to your soul, bless the Lord for who he is, for what he has done. Bless the Lord. And yes, bless him with your words. But also bless him with your deeds. Respond to him with genuine thankfulness. In holy fear. In both word and in deed. Let's pray. Father, you are merciful and gracious. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And we thank you that we need only to look to the cross of your son to see that that is true. And so we bless you, Father. We thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you are doing now, all that you are still to do. And we thank you, Father, for who you are. Holy Spirit, this week, teach us, help us, train us to be a people who have that continual posture of thankfulness towards our Father in word and in deed. For the glory of Jesus. Amen.